review it, uh, that the Rambam says there were four purposes uh, in the Chibor that we know as the Gemara. Uh, number one was to clarify the Mishnah, which the Gemara does by primarily using Brysos, Tosefta, Midrashe Halacha, and by a question and an answer uh, idea. Uh, the second was to clarify the Halacha when there's a Machlokas, and that was a little schwer because most sugyas do not give you the halacha, but I indicated to you that there are three ways that the Gemara often tells you the halacha. Sometimes it actually tells you halacha to so-and-so. Uh, other times uh, we have klolem of psak, right? The, the klolem, like when you have machlokes, Rabbi Kiva, and other people, halacha and Rabbi Akiva, that was created by the Amarim themselves. And the third way is the way a sugya is constructed you can see that the Gemara, the Gemara, meaning Rabina Ravashi and the Chachma Yisrael of that generation, they were telling you what the halacha is by directing your attention in a certain kivun. Uh, so that was the second role of the Gemara. The third role of the Gemara was to deal with new situations, new cases that are not in the Mishnah, and that you have Machlok Saman as well. And then the fourth, which is the last thing we started talking about, is the idea of Agada or Agadata is the Aramaic for it. And Agada, you'll remember, uh, really has no definition. In other words, uh, Agada is essentially defined by, by, a, by a negative. Agada is all discussions in the Gemara that are not halacha, are Agada. Uh, now, Agada could be a huge amount of things. It could be stories, both stories of biblical personalities like the Avais and Moshe Rabbeinu, David HaMelech Shlomo, <coughs> or they could be stories <coughs> about the Tanoim and Amirayim. Uh, it, uh, that's, that's one thing, the stories, narratives. Another could be teachings of Musr and Tashkafa in terms of Midos Tovos uh, and the like. Uh, a third could be in Yonim of Mashiach, Geula, Techiyah, Samesim. <coughs> uh, the fancy word for that would be eschatology, meaning things that end of days uh, types of things. Right? Uh, Agada can also be things like medicine, science, astronomy, because I'll have observations about that, that as well. So there's really not a Tzad HaShava, meaning to say there's no definition of what Agada is, other than those in Yonim that do not directly pertain to, to Halacha. Uh, now, the Rambam writes that some people make fun of Agadita, they think it's not important, but in fact, Agada contains all of the great foundations of Emuna, belief in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Yeah. I gonna, so I know sometimes the Gemara is set up in a way that it's like made, that it's, it's I've heard that it's aided to like memorize it. Mm -hmm. If it was written down, why, why didn't it necessarily so that, that, that's a very interesting question. Uh, the interesting question is, when we say Ravina and Ravashi were Masadir, they were Masadir the Shas, meaning they edited it, they put together all of the Shaklavatarias, does that mean that there was a written, m most people understand it, that's the way I think, you know, most people understand it, that they had produced a book or whatever, they produced how many volumes you would have. Uh, well, it wouldn't be volumes, it would be scrolls. There was a written work called the Talmud that emerged from Ravina and Ravashi, and maybe there was final editing by the Sabo Ra'im, who is a very enigmatic uh, generation between the Amoraim and the Gaonim, so they did final editorial work. But the MS is, there are some shitas that say that uh, Rabin and Ravashi still kept the Gemara an oral work, Tarisha Balpeh, uh, but they just organized the order and the sequence, which would enable people to memorize it. And it was not written down until much later in the time of the Gaonim. There's really a big, big shaila when Rabin and Ravashi uh, were Masadir the Shas. What does Masadir mean? Does Masadir mean it was written down as a book? or they simply created the order and the structure. So instead of having a million different Gemaras, because if the Mishnah was being learned in many, many yeshivos over hundreds of years, so essentially there was not one Gemara, meaning every yeshiva had its own uh, Jerachim and the like. Ravina and Ravashi brought everything together and they determined, uh, again, with all of the Chachme Yisrael of the generation, they determined the Seder Halimut, 
but according to some, they did not necessarily write it down. There's a lot of questions we don't have definitive answers for. Uh, the Rambam doesn't tell you Beferish, and uh, there, there, there are Machleksim about it, which means, in a sense, if you think about this, the purpose of the Gemara is a little different than the purpose of the Mishnah, meaning like this. Rav Yudha Hanasi wrote down the Mishnah, even though you're not supposed to write down the oral law, because there was a danger that people would forget the oral law, and even though it's usher to write down Torah Shabal Peh, at least as a public work, private notes were always permitted, this is Nichlal in the famous Pasuk in Tehillim, Eis Lasais Lashem, a favorite Torah Secha, when it is a time to stand up for Hashem, uh, for the survival of Torah, you're allowed to violate Torah. Again, this is not something we can decide on our own, but G'daylam can sometimes give up sak, eis lasas lashem. So in Rav Yudha Nasi's case, they actually matured an iser. They matured the iser of writing down Torah Shabal Peh. In Gemara, it may be a little different. It's true that the ultimate impetus for being Masadr the Gemara was a fear that things would be forgotten. That is true. But, if you understand that Ravashi and Ravina did not write down something, they simply gave an order by which it should be learned. So it turns out that the way they dealt with Shechecha was not at that point maturing the Isser of writing down Torah Shabal Peh. They dealt with Shechecha by organizing it in such a way that you'd remember it and the like. And only later, there was a neis lasleish lashem to write it down. So, in a way, therefore, it could be that the, the genesis of Gomorrah was a different genesis, so to speak. Although both of them were because of shikacha. But the genesis of Gomorrah was a different genesis than the genesis of Mishnah, because the Gomorrah itself was preserved orally. And I, think, I believe, I, I, I want to check this, that we have... Um, one of the greatest of Ga'inim was Rav Shurei Ragain. Rav Shurei Ragain was the father of Rav Haigain. Rav Haigain is considered actually to be the greatest of the Ga'inim, but Rav Shurei Ragain was right before Rav Haigain. And Rav, ha Rav Shurei Ragain actually wrote a letter explaining the, a lot of it is historical about the Ga'inim themselves. He goes over the history of the Ga'inim up to his point, but he also goes over the Tanoim and the Amoraim and the order in which the Gemara was written. I believe, Rev Shrey Regain says, I, I, although I want to check it, that the Gemara itself was oral, was memorized for a number of, a, a number of generations, which is very, very fascinating. I mean, imagine, uh, imagine the idea of a whole Gemara being you know, memorized, but that was the order in which sugyas were, were preserved. So if that's the case, this is a long-winded answer, but that would explain why the Gemara is written in a way that you can memorize it, because in point of fact, it had to be memorized for a few generations. Yeah. When they mastered the Isser of writing it down, were they, was, it, was it just for that instance, or were they, was that the point where they So here is where, here is where uh, you really have a very, very good question. Because it's brought down uh, that the reason why the Mishnah is written in such an abbreviated way, the Mishnah is written in sometimes an unclear way, was because Rav Yudha Hanasi didn't want to matur the Yisr Lagamri. He only wanted to matur enough of the Yisr so people could remember it, you know, just like a lot of times. Uh, if you learn something and you don't remember it, but you see a little bit of a reminder, that triggers your memory. So the Mishnah was written to be a memory trigger rather than a complete writing because Rebbe wanted to keep it Tarish Pen. Now that would suggest at some point that this was a temporary one-time type of type of hedger. So the question would be this. I mean, Bisman Hazah, let's say, and not just Bisman Hazah, but over certainly a, over a thousand years, uh, we don't seem to keep this thing at all. We write Svarim, we publish Svarim. I mean, I mean, nobody, I mean, nobody takes the attitude, gee, I can't publish a Sefer because you're not allowed to write down Torah Shabal Peh. I mean, nobody has those Havaminas. Which means at some point, the Isser was taken off totally. But I, I have a Kasha too. I can't point exactly when that happened. Because the Mishnah itself was clearly done in such an Eifen that it was like a temporary thing just for that. It could be, though, that at whatever point it was permitted to write down the Gemara, which is already 
an expansive commentary, it could be at that point the Yisr is nitcha lechalutim. But it's a bit of a problem there, especially if you say this was done by the Gainim. I mean, they didn't have the same authority as the Amoraim. So like, who gave them the Heter uh, to do it? That's going to be a bit of a problem. So there are some, some problems there that we don't have complete answers. Now, they do tell a story, although Halacha, it doesn't make sense, but I'll tell you the story anyway. Uh, the Chassam Seifer had a Rebbe. And the Chassam Seifer was machshiv this Rebbe tremendously. And it's important to know that because the Rebbe is not so famous as the Chassam Seifer. But if the Chassam Seifer was machshiv this Rebbe, Ad Kedei Shemayim, you have to realize how great the Rebbe was. And the Rebbe was Rav Nassan Adler. Uh, now, some of you might have heard of Rav Nassan Adler because probably in connection with the Chassam Seifer. But the Chassam Seifer was very, very aduk to Rav Nassan Adler. Uh, but one of the reasons Rav Nassan Adler is not well known is Rav Nassan Adler publishes no svarim at all. In fact, there are many, many great gedolim that when they die, we don't really know of them that much because they didn't leave anything over so much for the next generation. So if a great gadol died 200 years ago and there's no safer, it's a little hard for us to connect. We just don't know about him that much. So Rav Nassan Adler did not uh, leave any svarim. Uh, but in all of his svarim, all of the books that he owns, Shas, whatever, Rambam, there are a bunch of dots. You open up the Gemara and all you see are dots all over the place. So what, what was the pshat? So what they say is that a dot was every place Rav Nassan Adler had a chiddish. But Rav Nassan Adler held that you're not allowed to write down Teresh of uh, You're only allowed to write it down because otherwise it'll be forgotten. And since he says he never forgot anything, he held, he didn't have a heter to write down Torah Shabbal Peh because there was no shichicha. So, <laughs> so the MS is, the MS is, I have two kashas on this Misa. Kasha number one is that, uh, first of all, the Rambam says to write down private notes for yourself is Vadai Mutter. So he didn't have to be machmer. And on the other hand, he didn't need the private notes. So maybe that's it. He just, private note. I could write private notes for me, but I don't need private notes for me. But the other kasha is uh, that the shikacha is not only mitzad the teacher, the shikacha is mitzad the talmidim. Rav Nassan Adler had talmidim, etc. And uh, people would forget his Torah. Like today, we, you know, we don't know a lot of the Torah of Nassan Adler. So to make a cheshben that the heter of Eis Lasais Lashem doesn't apply to me because I don't forget is ignoring the fact that you're talking about other people who do forget. Right, so it's, it's, it's a bit of a shver maisa, but at least Rav Nassan Adler, if you can, if you could be medayik from a maisa, and many people say you can't be medayik from maisa at all, uh, indicates that there's still ka'ain a certain iser of writing down Torah Shabbat Peh if you truly don't have to write it down. But as I say, by, by and large, uh, we don't seem to be very machmer on, on that at all. Today we consider it to be legamri, legamri mutter. Uh, so again, I, I want to go over what the Rambam says about Agadita. Uh, first of all, uh, Stamazay, what percentage of, of Shas, of the Bab, Talmud Bavli, is Agadita? So it's, it's hard to know. Different Masechdas have different proportions. Uh, Brachos has a lot of Agadita. The 11th parak of Sanhedrin is all Agadita. Right? Sota has a lot of Agadita. Some Masechdas have very little Agadita. But it's estimated around 30-35% uh, of the Gemara is what we would call Agadita. And I think I mentioned before that uh, although Agadate is very, very deep, but on a superficial level, you know, it's easier going, maybe, than, maybe, than Halacha. Uh, of course, Agadate is, might be, is, is actually harder linguistically because Agadate tends to be written in a more pure Aramaic. Again, I, I don't have a, a complete answer for this. Halachic discussions tend to have less Aramaic than Agada discussions. Agada discussions tend to be almost 100% pure Aramaic. And as a result, uh, if you're not yet so familiar with Aramaic, uh, the taich of Agadita might be more difficult. The words of Agadita might be more difficult. But if, if Aramaic is not a problem and it's just a matter of content, so on a superficial level, Agadita is easier to learn than Halacha, on a superficial level. So that's why I had mentioned in the time of the Beis Yasef, uh, Mahari Beirav, Rav Yaakov Beirav, who was, one, who was the Beis Yosef's uh, Rebbe, 
Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Rav, Rav Yaakov ben Chaviv, a different person, also at the same time. But around the time of the Beis Yosef, Rav Yaakov ben Chaviv uh, was malakate from the Bavli, all of the Agadic portions, Rav Yaakov uh, ibn Chaviv, and he published them as a separate sefer that was called Ein Yaakov. Right, so what is Ein Yaakov? Ein Yaakov is simply a collection of all of the Agadic portions from the Talmud Bavli. He also started being malakate on the Talmud Yerushal, or from the Talmud Yerushalmi. Uh, he only did it for Seder Zerayim. He, he never finished uh, the, the Yerushalmi on the other Sedarim, although other books uh, have, done, have done so. And the Ein Yaakov, uh, as it's eventually printed, has you know, not only the Gemaras, but also the Rashi, the Tosvos, the Marsha, many, many other Mephorshim as well. And there are new Ein Yaakovs coming out with new Mephorshim and everything else. I think Art School now started uh, doing Ein Yaakov. It's interesting to sit down and compare the Art School Ein Yaakov with the Art School Gemara, meaning to say, uh, I'd like to know, as a, if I wanted to be a purchaser, right, if I have an Art School Shas, and I want to purchase Natsukul and Yaakov, I want to know, did they just, did they just take out of the Gemara uh, and put it on the Ein Yaakov, or is it something that's new? Again, buyer beware, got to check out these things, uh, and, and the like. So Ein Yaakov became a very, very popular limud, particularly in the shtetlach, the small towns. In Europe, where many people were working, they were not Tomedei Chachamim, they couldn't necessarily halt cup in a complicated Gemara here. But they would learn Ein Yaakov between Mincha and Mairef and, and the like. So there's even an expression in Yiddish when you talk about a simple, sincere Jew that is not learned, the expression that's given is he's an Ein Yaakov Yid. It's not an insult. It's, it's kind of a term of endearment that he's a simple, honest, conscientious Yid who keeps mitzvahs and tries to learn every day. But he's an Ein Yaakov Yid, meaning he's not a uh, big, big uh, Talmud Chacham. Uh, it is said that in virtually every shtetl, every small town, uh, there was like an Ein Yaakov Shir, between Mincha and Marif, uh, typically. And even today, you walk into uh, like working people's shows, you know, you'll see an Ein Yaakov Shir uh, and, 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 and the like. And it is said that in Vilna, one of the things the Vilna Gaon did behind the scenes is the Vilna Gaon wanted to ensure that every shul, every minion, every shtibel, every small group of people, there was shiurei Torah given to working people in Balabatim. Uh, so we organized Chaye Yodam shiurim and uh, Halacha shiurim, Mishnaya shiurim, Ein Yaakov shiurim, etc. And it is said that the first shir he would give himself. Very, very, very interesting. That uh, if he would start a new Ein Yaakov shir, he would give the first shir. And then the regular teacher would take over. So imagine this, the Vilna Gaon would sit with a group of simple, of course in Vilna probably a simple Balabas was maybe much higher than we are, but he would sit with simple Balabatim, he would do a Yaakov with them, and of course the day that he came, <laughs> all the great Tamarei Chachalum of Vilna also came to this year, so it wasn't the normal clientele, but this was the Grashita, he wanted to show people how Chashuv uh, any type of learning is, and he therefore would, um, would give the first share, whether it was Ein Yaakov, Chai Yodam, uh, whatever it would be. Actually, Chai Yodam, that's an interesting uh, situation. The, the Baal Chai Yodam was the Vilna Gaon's uh, Mechutin, their children married. So it's interesting, he was actually related to the, to the Chai Yodam in that way. Okay, so in the Bavli, uh, Agadita is around 30, 35%. In the Yushalmi, it's a little less. Uh, but there's Agadah in both the Bavli and the Yushalmi. And again, remember the Rambam's important you cite. Uh, the Rambam says that all Agadah is MS, but the MS of Agadah is not always literal. And that's a big mistake. There are people that say Agadah is literally true and they're foolish. And there are people that say Agadah is superstitious Babi Mises and they're Rishayim. So, as I said before, Better to be foolish than evil, if you had to make a choice, but it's better to be smart and righteous. So the Rambam says the smart and righteous derech is to understand that call divrei chachamim emes, but the emes is sometimes symbolical. 
And in Agadata, it's not always meant to be literal. Now, as I mentioned, the Rambam made a promise to us that unfortunately he was not able to keep, that he would explain which Agadatas are literal and which are symbolic. Uh, we do not have such a safer, so we don't know. Uh, but we have Mepharshim, the Gra, the Maral, the Ramchal, I go over and explain various Agadatas. I think I mentioned Rabbi Feldman's, Rabbi Aaron Feldman's book, The Juggler and the, what is it, Juggler and the, and the King, uh, which is really an adaptation of the Vilna Gones commentary on some Agadatas. And so you see a very good uh, idea of what does symbolic interpretation, interpretation mean. Uh, the point I'm making is, or the point that the Rambam is making is, that if you read things in Agadata that seem preposterous, that seem impossible, that seem superstitious, chas v'shalom, you should never dismiss it as superficial. There are deep, deep spiritual meanings in Agadata that the Chachamim wanted to convey through mashal and through story and through parable. Now, if Zosalantar gives a very intriguing mashal that kind of illustrates the way Chazal communicated ideas. And he said the following. In 19th century Russia, now he's talking about what happened in his, his time. Uh, the Jews in Russia under the Tsar, this is under the Tsar, were confined to only certain parts of Russia. They were not allowed to live in other parts of Russia. And the area in which they were confined was called the Pale of Settlement, P-A-L-E, Settlement. Uh, in other words, they were allowed to live in only a certain geographical area. If they wanted to live uh, outside of that area, they needed special permission, special rishos, you had to be rich. I mean, there were a few people who were able to get exempt from that, but the vast, vast majority of Jews were crowded into a relatively small area. Now, what happened was that the czars were always changing the areas. It was just harassment, just anti-Semitism, basically. So you might get a notice that says, uh, in two weeks or two days, you have to get out of here and you have to move 10 miles to the west. Like, no particular reason, just got to move. So in the middle of the night, the middle of the day, you just get this hachraza, got to be out of your home in uh, five minutes, you know, in two days, whatever it would be. And this happened quite a lot. It was always happening. People were moving here, moving here, moving here. They didn't have papers. They were expelled from here. This was a common harassment. I mean, Jews were used to it. It was a common harassment uh, in the 19th century in the Russian Empire. So let's imagine you were a journalist with a flair for words. And you were describing, this is Rav Yoslantris Machel, you were describing what was happening to the Jews of Russia. So let's imagine you wrote your newspaper article this way. With a drop of ink, 100,000 Jews were drowned by a drop of ink. What does that mean? The Tsar signs a proclamation, and 100,000 Jews, their life undergoes a tremendous change. A drop of ink drowned 100,000 people. Now, let's imagine 100 years later, some person finds that newspaper and doesn't really know what the story was and says, a drop of ink from the Tsar's pen drowned 100,000 people. How can a drop of ink drown 100,000 people? Was the Tsar a giant and a drop of ink was like an ocean? Were the 100,000 people like midgets, like Gulliver's Travels? What type of stuff is this? How can a drop of ink drown 100,000 people? So a person would look at this newspaper article, or newspaper headline, let's say, and say, this is Rabbi Zoslantris Machel, say, this is stupid, this is unbelievable, this never happened, this guy is making up stories. But if you know what he's really talking about, how the Tsar just signed a document and 100,000 people's lives were changed, you can see how vivid and powerful this metaphor is, the drop of ink destroyed 100,000 people. So Rabbi Zoslantar says that the language of Agadita speaks that way, lahavdil. The language of Agadita may say something like, a drop of ink you know, drowns somebody. But it doesn't mean a drop of ink drowns somebody. 
It means a proclamation, a document, you know, changed people's lives. Right? So that's poetic language, symbolic language. This is not epicorsis. <laughs> this is what the Rambam essentially says. And the Ramchal says as well. I mean, much later. Uh, and that is the idea that truth can be communicated by symbol, by mashal, by story. So chas v'shalom, one should never be mezalzel in Agadata because it is always true. It is 100% true. This is not saying it's not MS. But the MS is not always going to be the literal meaning of the words. The literal meaning of the words is often going to be a mashal for a deep spiritual truth. And the deep spiritual truths may, may in fact, uh, may be from all the way back to Moshe B'Sinai. But that doesn't mean the story is. The story, the lavush, the garment, the mashal, was made by Chazal. They didn't have a halacha of Moshe B'Sinai on the particular mashal, but they took spiritual ideas and they dressed them in metaphors and, and the like. Uh, yeah. Um. Should they have been um, concerned at all about future generations and misinterpretations? Yeah, so here, here's a real problem. Yeah, again, there, there are a lot of problems here. The, the Rambam then addresses the problem. Well, why do they use Mishalom? Why don't they just say what the ideas are? Say what the ideas are. Don't, uh, don't give a, a story, don't make a parable, and the like. So the Rambam, in the course of a very long discussion, kind of gives two reasons, but the reasons are, 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 are almost contradictory, although maybe I'll suggest a way to answer them. One idea is that Chazal wanted to conceal the inner meaning because the meanings, the ultimate meanings might be misunderstood, might be misinterpreted. So Chazal gave you a story. So if you're on a madrega, you can understand the inner meaning. If you're not on the Madrega, all you have is a story, and maybe that'll be misinterpreted, but at least you're not going to pervert a spiritual truth. So according to, according to one approach in the Rambam, the, the symbolic language of Agarita was designed to obscure and conceal deep truths from people who would not yet be ready to absorb those deep truths. So I sit and I listen, I hear a nice story. All right, Beseder. That's what Rav Nachman of Breslov used to say. Rav Nachman of Breslov also used to teach his Hasidus by stories. So he said, when you teach by stories, it's a no-lose proposition. If someone gets the message, Baruch Hashem, and if they don't get the message, they have a nice story. So what's wrong? So that seems to be one approach the Rambam is saying. Uh, there are deep truths concealed in stories, and Hazal didn't want to say the truth explicitly, because some people would misinterpret it and do bad things with it. Okay, that's one reason. But then he gives another reason, which is almost the opposite. And that is, the story and the symbol helps us understand the idea. That the idea might sometimes be so abstract and so difficult that we need like a story, we need a mashal to be able to understand what's going on. So these are, two, these, are, I mean, these are two opposite reasons. I mean, one idea is the mashal is designed to conceal. And the other is the mashal is designed to reveal. So like, which is it? But the answer is both things happen at the same time. For those who are capable of absorbing the ultimate message, the mashal helps them absorb the message. For those who are not capable, the mashal obscures the message and they just walk away with the story. You see? So the Rambam combines both, both ideas at, at, the same, at the same time. Now I had mentioned uh, the symbolic meaning of Agadita. Uh, the Rambam did not give us directly, although he'll give you one example. He kind of gives you a preview of what he would have written in his book. I'll, I'll get to the, to the one example that he gives you. But as I say, the symbolic language is basically the gra, the maral. Uh, maral wrote on most, most of the Agadita in the Babylonian Talmud. Most of the Agadita Maral has commented on. Uh, and this is Chidushe Agadas Maral. Uh, 
very strangely, uh, the Chedush Yagad of Maral begins with Masechus Shabbos. It does not cover Masechus Brachos, which is kind of very, very odd because Brachos has so much Agadita. But uh, Rabbi Lapiansky, you may, I don't know if you know Rabbi Lapiansky, he's uh, from, uh, well, he's, he's from here, but uh, he's now the Rosh Hashiva in Silver Spring, very, my, my old place, a very, very Cheshavah Talmud Chacham. He actually compiled from the Maral's other Svarim, other Svarim, a Chidushe Agadas Maral and Brachos. So you can actually get Maral and Brachos because he, he, he's Malachite, because there are many other places in Maral's writings where he comments on Gemara's and Brachos, main, mainly Agadita. By the way, Maral, I just, I, just, I just should point out, although Maral's writings are overwhelmingly on Agadita, I mean, Maral, like 95% of what Maral writes is on Agadita, but the Maral was considered to be one of the great, great Gedolei HaPoskim. Uh, uh, and uh, for whatever reason, we don't have a lot of writings from Manalacha, but he was regarded as a great, great Posek in halacha, in halacha as as well. Yeah. How would uh, the Rambam or the Maral have known the deeper truths and secrets of the Rambam? Uh, you know, it's it, it's hard to know because again, it's not like I, I cannot say that there was a Messiah here. But basically, a person who learns all parts of the Torah, including Kabbalah, mm -hmm. absorbs many many ideas, and then they can see in Chazal that this is the idea Chazal were trying to communicate. Essentially, it really comes from your knowledge of all of the Torah. That when, I, when a person knows all of the Torah, they can then look at this part of the Torah and bring to bear everything they know to try to explore this passage. But again, I, I cannot say there was a, there was a Messiah in this. Uh, there was not necessarily a Messiah, uh, but this was the Chidushim that a person has from understanding, understanding this, yeah. Sometimes within the Talmud, when a guy that comes up, it'll be in like weird situations, it'll be like brought up by a, a, an obscure whole of concepts, or sometimes completely unprompted. So how exactly are we supposed to understand when and where they come up? And why Hazal being just separated entirely from the halakha? Yeah, yeah. Again, you're, you're, it's a very good question. The, the division line between halakha and agada is not entirely clear. In fact, even in the Ein Yaakov, there's some confusion sometimes in which halachic things get in, agadic things are not in, whatever it would be. Uh, and certainly, you're 100% correct that in the middle of agada, there will be many halachic issues that will pop up in, 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 various, in various ways. Um, so I'm not suggesting, you know, there's going to be a sharp, sharp division. Things are intermingled and things are intermixed. Uh, why Chazal didn't separate it, though, I think it's because they wanted to create a unity. They wanted to show that at least, if not the actual stories, but at least the spiritual ideas are just as much a part of Torah as the halacha itself, as opposed to separating them separating them, them out. You know, uh, one of the great commentaries on Shas generally is the Marsha. Right? Every Gemara, almost every Gemara, even a Gemara without a lot of Mephorshim, always has Marsha in the back. Marsha is Marena of Shmuel Eliezer, who lived in the 1500s in Poland. And you will note that the Marsha has two commentaries that are printed with, together. Chidushe Halachos, the Chidushim on Halacha, the halachic portions, on Gemara Rashi Taisvis, and Chidushe Agados on the Agadic portion, right? They're, they're printed together. But the difference is uh, the Chidushe Halachos are a larger typeface, and Chidushe Agados is a smaller typeface. Uh, in the world of Lom De Torah, the way you measure the decline of your eyesight is whether you can still read the Chidushi Agados of the Marsha. Uh, at some point you realize, can't do it, unless I have a magnifying glass or something, and that's how you know. Right? We, don't, we don't remember our birthdays, but we remember, you know, can I, look at, can I read the Marsha or not? And that, that tells us all that we are getting old. So Mir uh, you should be zaycha to read uh, the Chidushi Agados uh, uh, no, for, a long, for a long time. Okay, um, yeah, uh, the Marsha, Abrachsham, I know, I know that this, the Shiorim and Orsameach uh, do emphasize Marsha, and that's very, very good. But in many of the yeshivas, they stopped learning Marsha, because the Marsha is too Pshat-oriented. He's not Mephalpal a lot. 
And there's a letter from the Chazenish. Goes, this goes back uh, 70, 80 years, a long, long time ago, where the Chazenish said that the day that Klal Yisrael has forsaken the Marsha, they have abandoned the MS of Torah. That the Marsha is Pshat Amitai. And uh, what do they say? The Velt says, they used to say in the yeshivas in Europe, that if the, if the Marsha asks a kasha on Taisvis, and you were not mechaving to that kasha when you learned the Taisvis, it means you weren't thinking about the Taisvis enough. That the Marsha's kashas are things that you should think of yourself when you go into something uh, in a thoughtful in a thoughtful way. Okay, so uh, that's the idea of the Agadita. And again, the Rambam's Yisait of symbolic meaning is an extremely important mafteach in Agadita. And Rabbi Sosalanter's Mashal also expresses the idea of poetic language. And again, as I say, some people sometimes think this is a little suspect, meaning, oh, you're turning Chazal into, into poetry. N not really. You just have to understand that that is sometimes the most powerful way of communicating spiritual truth. And the Rambam says, Lehepech, it's a way of concealing spiritual truth at the same time. And that's what Rav Chaim Shmulevitz used to say, that the reason yeshivas skip Agadita is not because it's so easy, as people think, but because it's so hard. <laughs> Therefore, it, it requires so much depth that we're not always ready to... Uh, uh, to teach it and uh, and 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 the like, but uh, as I say, uh, many many achronim use a mashal. They describe halacha as the goof of Judaism, the body. What do I do with my body? And agadita is the neshama, is the feeling, the emotion, uh, the, the 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 way you grow in avas Hashem and yiras Hashem. And Chazal say it befeish. It's a maimer Chazal. If you want to be makir, haraitza la hakir, misha amar vahaya ha'ilam. If a person wants to know God, know Hashem, whose word created the world, yasaik biagada. He should learn the passages of, of Agada. And if you look in the Mesila Shasharim, the Ramchal, the Mesila Shasharim, who talks about how does one inspire themselves to love Hashem, he talks about learning. Agadita, learning the Agadita, as it were. It's brought down that on Shabbos there's a special union of learning Agadita. Some, some, some uh, people had a minog that Shabbos they devoted to learning in Yanim of Agadita because of their neshama yaseira. They wanted uh, things that brought them to a kirvat elokim, a closeness uh, to Akadish Baruch. Yeah. What's the difference between Agada and Agadita? Yeah, same, same thing, same thing. Agada is Hebrew. And Agadeta is just the Aramaic uh, word for Agadeta. Sa same thing, same thing. It's not, not a, no, no, no difference as, as it were. Okay, uh, so that is uh, the idea of Agadeta. And then the Rambam uh, gives you a little bit of a preview. He promised to write you a book that would tell you which Agadeta are literal, which Agadeta are not. We don't have the book, but he picks one mimer, one mimer out of, of 10,000 mamorim to give you an example of the hidden meaning that Agadita possesses. And the one mimer that he picks happens to be in Maseches Brachos. And that's a mimer that says, Ein laha kadosh baruchu bi olamo, ela arba amais shel halacha. Hashem has nothing in this world that he owns, nothing that he possesses, but the four amais, of halacha. What does that phrase even mean? The four amos, eight feet, of halacha. So someone looks at that and says, what does that mean? Hashem is the one who created heaven and earth. Hashem is the master of the universe. He only has four amos of halacha. What does it mean he only has four amos of halacha? So the Rambam goes through biarichus, the idea that Hashem, and Hashem has a tachlis to the world, right? There's a reason God created the world. God created the world so there would be kedusha through Torah and mitzvahs. He created the world because of the Jewish people, and he created the world because of the Torah. Uh, Rashi brings this. Bereshis bara lokim. Because of reishis, God created the world. And Rashi says two things are called reishis, the beginning. One of the Jewish people, and one of the Torah. The world was created, so the Jewish people would bring Hashem into the world by the, by the Torah. 
So the Rambam says, so you got an obvious problem here. Okay, obviously not all Jews keep the Torah, that's free will. Okay, so, so, so yeah, in a way we're frustrating Hashem's plan, but Hashem made a world of free will, so we can't question that. Free will means that some people are not going to be doing the plan. Maybe most of us in some ways. But the Rambam says, there's so much in the world that doesn't seem to be connected to God's plan. Why are there so many... I don't want to be uh, anti-Gentile. Why are there so many Goyim? You know, if the world was created so Jews would keep the Torah, why are there so many Goyim in the world? Okay, I'm not, nothing against Goyim per se. Uh, uh, why are there so many of the Chinese, Indian, all, all of these things? What, what, what are they here for? So the Rambam says, when you look at the multiplicity of everything in the world, it has to be that on some level, it helps the Jewish people fulfill their mission. Everything. So if China invented, I don't know, semiconductors, whatever it would be, that creates, you know, websites that can be Mafar same Torah. Telephones, automobiles, trains, planes. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that is being used for non-Torah purposes, but all of these things have a purpose. And their purpose is for Torah. Everything has to be, on some level, put into the world to help Am Yisrael fulfill its mission. Everything. So the Rambam gives an example. There may be a tree on a deserted tropical island in which nobody even lives except birds. And why is that tree there? And why are there fruit there? Because once in 500 years, some from Jew is going to be stranded on that island and will be able to eat an apple. Now, that doesn't fully answer, so why do I need the tree to be there for 500 years? I, I, I don't know, but the Rambam says everything, every little thing. I mean, they say after, during World War II, when some of the yeshivas relocated to Shanghai for a while. So, like Mir went to Shanghai, right? They found in the middle of China, a huge, beautiful shul with 500 seats, exactly the size of the yeshiva. Now, why would there be a huge, beautiful shul of 500 seats in Shanghai? Shanghai did not have 500 Jews. Because like 100 years before, some guy from, from Europe thought he was going to make a Jewish community in Shanghai, and he built a great shul, but there were no Jews there, so the shul was never used. It was totally, uh, you know, not used at all. But it was there when the Mir Yeshiva needed it. This is Mamish the Rambam's Mashal. So the Rambam says, when it says, there's nothing Hashem has in the world, but the four Amos of Halacha, again, it's a poetical expression that says, the world has many, many things. But all of those things are there just so the Yidden will learn in a small base medrash and learn Torah. Halacha here would mean Torah. And therefore the Rambam is saying what Chazal are telling us is that nothing has a purpose in the world except as it indirectly in some way facilitates the Jewish people learning Torah and doing mitzvahs. That's the example of the tree that may exist for hundreds and hundreds of years so the Talmud Chacham will have a little bit of shade for five minutes. And that's the tachlis of, 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 of everything. Okay, so the Rambam says that's an example of an agarata, which superficially you would not really understand, but you can see that Chazal are giving you a very profound meaning into the nature of reality, the purpose of existence, the purpose of the, of the world. And the Rambam says, kama vakama agaratas are that way, but as they say, we don't have his book, so we don't have uh, his explanation on each passage. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.